Um, so this section is kind of a little different section, and I'm beginning to calling it, well, Dave, Dave and, and Utah um, kind of said this, many times leaving a touching Toronto meeting where we saw people, healings, salvations, lives changed. And um, see, in Peterborough, it's a church blessing, but touching Toronto is an outreach blessing. And you and Dave would turn it to each other because at one time they didn't think they were supposed to be involved, but then God spoke to them. And they'd say, what if we'd said no? What if we said no? Many times the Lord's never answered me. Many times I've said, Lord, the people that have been healed, because I've seen lots of people healed under our ministry, but Lord, the people that have been healed under Pastor Billy's ministry, would they have been healed? I don't know. The Lord will never answer me because I suppose some is yes and some is no. But all the ones that were healed under his ministry, but it wouldn't have happened had we not gone. And yeah, it's a lot of work, but that's what life is. Life is work. And if you don't work while you're living, you're not gonna get the blessing on the other side. And I just think, well, Lord, what if we hadn't gone? Well, what if, you know, just the, the TV crew up there, Three, an ear, a person's ear opens. A lady with cancer healed. The lady who runs it, and they're getting excited about getting back into Toronto. They're already telling us they're coming with their cameras. They actually went and bought a whole sound system. I forgot this. So all we have to do is pay them to set up the sound system because they bought it just before everything shut down. But we didn't know, is your heart still for us? And he calls Colin up, and Colin's right there because there's a lot of work, and we've got Hall Crown all booked and um, we're doing a test run. But I thought, what if we didn't go? And so many times I've thought some of my friends that when a miracle service was in that place and they didn't come, you don't have to come to get healed. You could come just to see somebody else healed. You can come and just see that God touches people. That lady who hadn't eat, eaten in, in weeks just in, on just juice or something. And then Pastor Billy gives her food. The lady in his church in the States that had her stomach removed. The lady who was here the last time as we began to talk about God putting things back in her. And she says, I'm here. It was me that God put my ovary back in and surprised all the doctors. Imagine that the Lord had arranged while this lady was up here. The young man I talked about here recently that came with concussion. His whole school was off. Nothing, he couldn't do anything. His whole life had been changed. And that first night he gets to here and he says, that night, and then they invite him to stay overnight. And he says this, I think I was just there. Because see, when you come into a miracle service and you've never seen a miracle service and every television show has told you they're all scams and we're living in a world of scams right now. And you come in and that dad's dad was there probably scared. One time, Pastor Billy has these two 90-year-old sisters that would go to Walmart, lead people to Christ and then bring them out to Pastor Billy's meetings. And I was there one time when this crack addict girl had got delivered and she was in church because the 90-year-old ladies would meet her at Walmart and win them to the Lord. 90, not 98, 90, in, in their 90s. I never really, never ask a lady her exact age, but I know Billy said they were in their 90s. So they would bring her and then her mother who had not been with her daughter because her daughter's a crack addict for three years, not seen. Now she's really scared because her daughter is now no longer a crack addict, according to her mother. She's probably now a religious fanatic. And in some circles, people aren't sure which one is better, amen? And so it was so beautiful in that service. There you got your 90-year-old ladies, the evangelists. And then you got the 18-year-old girl coming off a three years drug addict, cursed. And there you got the mother. And I'm looking at this mother and I'm thinking, she's scared tonight. What has my daughter got into? But then as the night went on and love began to work and miracles began to happen, hallelujah, hallelujah. And I read the thank you note from the young man with concussion just a few weeks ago. So the, a lot of things in life is what if we hadn't given to our people in India? What if we had not put the station for 30 years? Sometimes I think even this church, I said it so many times, I think, Lord, I don't even know that they get what I'm saying. I have a letter here I'm not going to read tonight of all the pastors in Ukraine. 
And all those pastors would have been influenced in the early days, especially by our radio program, because this church just sent 5,000 US every year and for 30 years preached the gospel in the hot spot of the world right now. But what if we had not done that? What if we had not? Now tonight, it's a what if we had not? Because we got a young lady in our church who when she gives her testimony, Pastor, Pastor Billy doesn't mind it, but he doesn't love it. She'll get up and say, I thought you were a scammer. And he says, well, see, nobody really wants to think they're a scammer. But the problem is, he says, tell me the story. So I've asked Alima to come tonight. I'm going to interview her. And she's going to tell you some things you already know and some things you don't know. But see, Alima, Jam, and Mama Jamaica, what if we hadn't gone? What if they hadn't come? So Alima has been praying over there for the last hour. Lord, please tell Pastor Brian to get me up now so I can get through this. So let's welcome Alima. Come, we're just going to do a testimony tonight. <laughs> tell everybody who you are. Hi. I'm so grateful to be here. I'm the grateful one. It's Alima. If you forget how to pronounce Alima, just say the grateful one and I'll answer. How beautiful. So we want you to give a little bit of background. You're in Jamaica. You tell us what you want to tell us, and then we'll get to eventually to touching Toronto and Selwyn. But let's get back and find out what, where Alima came from. So born in Jamaica, um, my dad was an imam, Muslim priest, oh. and mom was a practicing Hindu. So mom would go to the Hindu temple, and dad would be the priest conducting the ceremonies. And as a little girl, I'm seeing sacrifices being made with animals and not understanding it and just watching daddy chanting different prayers in his language. And I'm looking at the people attending as little as I recall as little as six years old. And mom would be going to the Hindu temple and they're in these beautiful outfits. And, um, I'm looking at the people and I'm thinking, mm, I don't know if I want this. So life was really tough as a little girl. Daddy was an alcoholic. He was abusive and mom did the best she could. And she raised us. There were three of us living there, but I was the one with all the questions of why was I ever born? Because I'm hungry all the time. My dad's trying to kill me. He's chasing us on the streets with a machete. And when I watch Stephanie fast, it brings back yeah. some of what the questions that she asked. And the, many a times I'd say, why does life have to be this hard? And I'm so little. And I'd look up in the star into the heavens because daddy, when daddy does, and I love my dad, he was so funny, nice. but I didn't get to know him because 99.99% .99 of the time he was uh, intoxicated. So I believe that he was hurt. So he drank his pain away, but I didn't see that at the time. So hatred started to um, grow inside of me for dad. But I had, um, so I'm looking at mom and I'm thinking mom's sober. Why does mom have us here? But when I look back, mom didn't really have a choice because as a single mom, um, out of wedlock, it wasn't looked upon as a good thing. And I'm here thinking about running away from home, trying to get away from being hungry all the time and eating green mangoes because we had a huge mango tree um, at the front of the yard and we would get the salt put it on the green mangoes and that was our supper, our meals. And many, ta many times. times, yeah. So back to, I was observed the different gatherings of people under the different rituals and I'm questioning and daddy would say, um, mother earth. And he would talk about the moon and the stars. So I looked up one day and I think I recall I was six years old. I looked up in the sky and just about that time, I had the opportunity to go to a private Catholic school. 
now I'm learning about Christianity. And I looked up in the sky and I, I think I remember saying, whoever you are that put that sky up in, that star in the sky, whether you're Muslim or Hindu or Christian, I'm gonna find you. Because <laughs> man didn't put you up there. And I, of course, you all know where that question came from and that prayer came from. And looking back now 50 years later, I realize that prayer has been answered because I'm in the promised land today. Um, so when I, I, I looked at the congregation and I questioned, I said, I don't want this. So I went to the Christian school and I had favor upon me from all the principals of the different institutions. And now I was being taught biblical principles, who's a daddy, who's a mommy, and I would see parents, now this is a private school, I would see parents drop their kids off and they'd hug them and kiss them. And they'd come out the car and I'm like, I want that. So I actually went home and daddy was on the veranda on, um, and he was intoxicated and I looked at daddy, I think I was about seven years old at the time. I said, dad, you never hugged me and you never kissed me. And this is how I knew daddy was hurting Daddy started crying. He broke down and he started crying. And he looked at me and within a few seconds, he flipped right back into what he was, the aggression, and I had to take off. I had to run. I was really scared of daddy because he, uh, in my eyes, daddy would always want it out of the house, us to get out of the house. I'm not sure if it was his memories of childhood that us growing up in his household, he didn't want us around. So mom worked very hard at a factory um, late at night. And when mom was never around, we got scared. So we would go next door and get um, the carton boxes and lay them on the grass and 10, so mom would get off work at 10. She would come off the bus at about maybe 11 o'clock at night. My sister, my, my brother and I would be inside a concrete V where we're right in that tip on cardboard, just sleeping and waiting until mom gets off the bus. When mom gets off the bus, we were safe to go inside. And then I remembered at the Catholic, the, the, the school that I went to, I stole a Bible. It was a black Bible that looks almost like Pastor Brian's. And it's interesting that it looks just like that. And the letters were so huge. And I'm like, I like this, but I, I was clueless. I didn't know what it was. And I stole the Bible from school. And I went home and I just opened it up and I just didn't know how to read. And... Um, Long story short, I had the opportunity to learn Christian principles, so now I'm teaching Jam. Because we know- Because she's, she's a couple of few years younger than me. She's a year younger than I am, but Jam always looked at me as the example. But deep in my heart, I always thought, I have to get out of this. And the only way to get out of this is through my education. And I learned this from that kindergarten school, from the principal not knowing what faith was and calling on God to get me out. But to me, I got to go to school to get out of poverty. And so school was always a priority for me. So Jam, on the other hand, she will tell you her story. She got a raw deal. I was able to go to school and learn things very quickly because I questioned everything. And I had a good foundation to um, education basics education and reading and Jam did not have that. She was seven years behind. Because we were in poverty, daddy had a lot of money. He owned his own printing company, was very, very talented, but it all went into the liquor. So we never got that. So I grew up with bitterness towards dad because I'm looking, dad, you could pay for university and here I am struggling to go to school and only, I think I remember only twice my tuition was paid in the private kindergarten, but the principal did not put me out of the school. Um, so he took you under his heart. It was a lady. Oh. So she took me under her wings, and that was the first time wow. I tasted cornflakes. I was about seven years old, 
and mom didn't come for me at school, so I was little, and they, and they taught me how to take the bus home. And the principal saw me go booting it through the gate. I was so little, booting it through the gate, and she says, um, you come here to me. So when you hear that, you get so scared. We all felt that. I believe, I believe she's in heaven right now. And um, so she called me back, and I got to spend the night with her, but I was so scared of her. And that morning I woke up, and she put the cornflakes on the table with some milk. And that was the biggest treat for me because I never had that. And to live in a country like this where I can have eggs to this very day, it's, that's why I'm grateful. So you went to university? Yeah. Tell us what happened. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now, be, I, um, going to university, I had to get student loan because daddy wouldn't, again, none of that money came in. So I took the student loan, heavy in debt, and I was able to finish um, my university degree. What then degree, I, What degree was it? It was in uh, economics and accounting. And, but I started off first in computer science but I was just very distracted, so I had to jump faculties because I was just um, not settled. So I actually came out with a BSc in accounting and economics. And then, at that time, I was eating the leftover foods um, of my mom's sister. She was married to a doctor. So they would cook the meals for their kids, and she would live walking distance from the university. So what I did was I'd walk to the university and I'd take all the leftover food and I'd rent a locker on campus and put it all in there. And I would have that for the whole final year of university and that's how I survived. Wow. And um, after finishing that degree, uh, my aunt said to me, I can't go on to do my master's because remember education was my key to getting out of. And all during this time, I did not learn scriptural principles on faith of how to believe God to get out. So school was it. So my aunt says, sorry, you can't stay here. So I rented a room next door to her home and um, I made a decision. I said, if I don't get a job, I'm gonna commit suicide. I am not going back to that house because I know dad would be after me. Um, and within about three months of sending out hundreds and hundreds of resumes, I landed a job. Out of 250 applicants, four were selected. Wow. Now here is how God's ordering the step. Of the four of us, now I've always wanted to leave Jamaica, always. And um, a beautiful country, but I just never felt like I fitted. So I heard about applying to Canada, and I did not want to do it illegally. I wanted to do it the right way. I heard about applying to come to Canada using your degree and your work experience at that company. I went through the whole process, and within a year or two, I got accepted to come to Canada. Not knowing it was the opening of the door for mom and, mom and my sister, and now my brother. And they came how many years later? Uh, th that was about 13 years later. Mom joined me. Uh, and you know what the good thing about it, Pastor? When I was in Toronto, I was praying for Dad. Because I couldn't find my family. I hated them so much. I didn't want to see them. I didn't want to... Because I would blame them for why does life have to be so hard? So uh, there's so much hatred on the inside for Dad and Mom. And why did they have to have me? The wise, the wise, the wise. And in Toronto, I was learning 1 Corinthians 13 because I went to a Word of Faith church Beautiful. and I started praying for dad. And then steps got ordered. I found my sister, Jamila, that comes here. My so you hadn't seen her for years? No, and I didn't know where they were. And by... A, step, a few steps, somebody connected with her, and I wrote Jam a letter because Jam hated me and I hated her. And I wrote her a letter and I told her, I'm so sorry. 
And I didn't know she would find it in her heart to forgive me. And um, she just wanted to be reconnected again. So I finally got to go back to Jamaica. And this was when daddy had Alzheimer's. Now this is where I love what mom did. Mom never stopped loving daddy even though he was abusive because mom had nowhere to go, okay? Because family wasn't there for her. And to this very day, blood family is not there for her. This church has proven that blood doesn't necessarily come to your assistance, but God does. And he's proven it time and time again. And that's what mom is seeing. Okay, you can't, based on where we're coming from, they have their own challenges because it's, it's a third world country. They can't think about someone else outside their family. So we were struggling. So not knowing that coming to Canada would have allowed my mom to eat food that she would never eat before. Okay, so, um, so jam, we got reunited and then daddy was, had Alzheimer's. And Jam still had a hatred for dad. And I would buy diapers and ensure because daddy now couldn't eat. And this was the time I was able to reconnect with dad. Now daddy had eight kids and of all the eight kids, only three got to make restitution with daddy because daddy was very abusive. All his five kids, I look at them now and they're hurting. But the three of us, with Jam, I would go down. I said, Jam, come on now. We got to clean daddy up. We got to clean up the mess. And we got to change the diapers. We got to feed him. And she says, no, I can't do it. I said, come on now. I'm not here all the time. And she would come and we'd clean daddy. We'd change his diapers. And it was so fulfilling. Because you were operating in love. I was able to forgive dad. And it was a big thing for us and Jam. And we thank mom for that. And the crazy thing was, they do not allow a woman to stand in a mosque. But I did the eulogy for dad. Wow. And guess what the theme was? First Corinthians 13. <laughs> and that her people do hurtful things. So therefore, give them the benefit of the doubt. So thank God for that. Beautiful. So, um... Long story short, I knew I was able to make restitution with mom and jam. And um, they heard about touching Toronto. And so they came up yes. from Jamaica up to live with you in a basement apartment in Toronto, right? Where you just had one little window. It was tiny. So I was living in Richmond Hill before. And um, mom joined me in Richmond Hill for almost a year. So I had to, if I was working in, in the east... I had to go home, pick up mom in the center, and then boot it to Billy Burke because I could not go to Billy Burke without getting mom. So mom fell in love with Billy Burke's ministry <laughs> just by watching on TV because I would volunteer with the ministry of Billy Burke. So Jam and mom would stream him from Jamaica. And I don't know if you remember, Jam would put her tithe in a jacket pocket inside her closet. And every time I went to Jamaica, she would convert it to U.S. and says, take this and give it to Billy. Jam never messes with her tithe. <laughs> never. And I don't either. And I believe that's why. When you think about where I'm coming from, I came to Peterborough with over 65 grand in debt. Just spiraling downwards through mistakes and through feeding my family and shipping barrels of food, toiletries um, down to Jamaica. And that, that was really expensive. And uh, so I kept getting into that more and more. And miraculously, that 65 grand plus Jam's tuition is fully paid for. Jam landed a car. Fully paid for. Yeah, let's stop and give God thanks for a little bit. Thank you, Lord. 